Hey YouTube, welcome back to the Crazy Cycling Channel. So I've decided to start a video series on flipping bikes. And as you can see, I have three lined up there on the ground behind me, ready to go. Now, if you've been following this channel at all, you may have seen the series I did on the 1973 Schwinn Continental. And that bike was really more of a learning experience for me. I bought that bike on a whim, and I didn't really set out to make money, although it was kind of in the back of my mind. And I ended up making even less money than I thought it would. I made about $30 and put in about six hours of work. Um, but since then, I became inspired to scour the internet and see if I could find some bikes that I actually thought maybe I could make some money on. So I was browsing around on Facebook and actually last week ended up finding three bikes that I thought were selling for way less than they're worth. So in this video, I'm going to introduce the bikes and then we'll fix up the first one I bought, which is the 2020 Specialized Cirrus X 2.0, the teal bike there on the ground behind me. So we'll fix that up. And that particular bike I actually like quite a lot, so I might keep it for a while. But hopefully by the time this video publishes, I'll sell that bike. And then I'll tell you how much I spent on it, the profit and everything else. And you'll see what I did to it. So hope you enjoyed this little mini series. Okay, so let me just talk you through the three bikes I bought. The first bike I got is a Specialized Cirrus X 2.0. I think it's a 2020 model and it's the teal hybrid mountain bike there on the ground behind me. And I paid $200 for the bike. And I think that bike is worth more like $600. On eBay, it's listed for between six and $800. Um, now that bike was up for a little while and the picture was really, really, really bad. It was a really grainy, blurry picture. The flash had reflected off the bike and it really wasn't a very good listing at all. And to be honest, I kind of thought it was a stolen bike. Um, so I had some doubts about that bike. I actually thought about it for a couple days before contacting the guy, but it was still up after a couple days, first of all. And second of all, I could see the guy's full Facebook profile. And when I messaged him, he wanted to meet at his house. So I went over there and he told me that he was leaving the state and he'd bought the bike a few years ago for his son uh, and just didn't need it anymore. I guess the son didn't really ride it. Uh, and I paid him $200 and I thought that was a really good deal. That bike is also in my size. It's a size L um, and it's in really nice condition. I don't think it's been ridden very much at all. There's a couple of scrapes, a little bit of rust on some of the bolts, but that bike is in really nice shape. So I think that was selling way lower than it should have. Uh, and I think the main reason is because the guy's pictures really weren't very good. So that's the first bike I bought. By the way, I haven't ridden that bike yet because it has a flat back tire. Uh, so I'm going to ride it today after I fix that on this video. Um, so that's the first bike. And then I just started looking a bit more on Facebook. And about a week later, I think I bought that two weeks ago. Um, and then earlier this week, I was looking on Facebook and happened to see the black bike and then the yellow bike. And they were both located near a place I was going uh, for work. They're actually both close to Detroit. The black bike is a Schwinn Prelude and I think it's from the 80s and that bike was listed for $250 and the picture was a close-up of the wheel. So I think that's why that bike kind of slipped through the cracks. Also, it's that's not the best price in the world for that bike in my opinion, but I had a little look on eBay and someone sold just the frame set for $200 on eBay. And that bike has a, an aftermarket carbon fiber wheel. And I think that wheel is also worth between $100 and $200, maybe $200 on the high end, plus all the components. So I think I can get maybe $450 out of that bike. So potentially make a profit of about $200. Uh, so I messaged that guy and he was more than happy to meet up. Um, and you could tell this guy had expensive taste. That's a pretty high end Schwinn. Um, and obviously he put the, um, the carbon fiber rear wheel. There's a spare tube and this tube is a really high end handmade tube. Uh, he's got the aero bars on there. He had a really fancy car and he told me he bought a new carbon fiber road bike. And so he was selling that one. Um, and it seems pretty well maintained as well. So I think that was a pretty good deal, potentially the worst deal out of the three, but I still think I can maybe make a couple hundred dollars. And with that bike, I'm going to part it out and sell the frame and the back wheel on eBay and then sell the parts. Not sure what I'll do with the front wheel yet, but I'll probably try and sell that locally 
Uh, so that's my plan with that bike. And then the last bike is a uh, Le Monde Buenos Aires. And that bike is, is a kind of a famous bike for some reason. Uh, I've seen them before on Facebook and they always go really, really quickly. And depending on the year, they're listed online often around $500. I think that's a later one. I think it's from um, 2001, something like that, maybe 2002, 2003. Um, so that bike to me, it looks older than it is, but it's a pretty modern bike. The guy claims it has a carbon fiber fork. Uh, we'll maybe check that with a magnet. Um, and that is a very well-maintained bike, but there are a couple scratches on it. And that bike I saw literally an hour or two after it was listed on Facebook. That's why I was able to get that bike. I think it would have gone right away. His pictures were normal and nice. Um, and I paid $250 for that bike as well, which I thought was a pretty good price because they do seem to sell for closer to 500. So maybe I can make, you know, $200 on that bike. And that bike, I'm just gonna straight flip uh, and resell here in Lansing. Maybe a student will buy it, or there's a lot of bike enthusiasts in Lansing. So I think someone will buy that bike. I might give it a little tune up, wait till the weather's warmer, which could be this weekend, and then try and resell that one. So those are the three bikes I bought. But today, let's go ahead and tune up the Specialized Series X. This isn't, sh well, it shouldn't take very long. There's nothing really wrong with it. I'm just gonna wash the bike. I'm going to uh, just tune up the gears and obviously fix the tire as well. So let's go ahead get it in the stand and get started. Okay, so here's the Specialized Cirrus X 2.0 and let's just talk about the bike briefly before I start working on it. Now this bike retails for in the region of seven to eight hundred dollars and that's the low mid to mid range of bike prices. And for that price, I think that Specialized made some really good design choices here. For that price of bike, you're not going to get too many branded components. So things like the stem, the crankset, uh, the wheels, the hubs, none of that is branded. But you get a micro shift advent uh, drivetrain, which is a really interesting drivetrain. It's a one by eight. And I don't know much about it, but in my opinion, micro shift makes pretty good stuff. And the one by eight system is really interesting because it's kind of a hybrid of modern and old school. I mean, but eight speed is kind of a very classic uh, drivetrain style, but they've made a one by out of it. That's pretty interesting. It should be a really reliable drivetrain, but just a bit more modern than the doubles and triples that you get on a lot of cheap bikes. So I think that's definitely a step up. The one thing I did notice about this drivetrain is that this derailleur does not have a clutch. So this could be prone to some chain slap because there isn't that tension on the chain. But you know, overall, that's a really interesting uh, choice in drivetrain. Also, when this bike came out was during COVID and that's when a lot of bike manufacturers started going to micro shift and other brands. I think that's a really good choice. Really interesting. I'm excited to try and ride it. The brakes are also interesting. They're from a company called Promax and these brakes seem insane. I've never heard of Promax before, but look at this. I mean, you probably can't really tell without feeling the brakes, but the stopping power seems crazy and the rotors are 160 millimeters um, and this is not a well-known brand but the reputation of Probax is really good online and that's really impressive also their hydraulic discs which you don't always see on bikes in this price range and that is one of the first upgrades I'd make if I was designing a bike in this price range is get hydraulic discs so this whole drivetrain brake system is pretty modern and it makes a very positive impression in my opinion. Aside from that, there's not all that much to say about this bike. It's kind of a weird hybrid mountain bike type bike. The tires are somewhat wide. They're 700C tires, uh, 700C wheels. Um, and this bike is it really, it's like a hybrid bike, but a pretty strong hybrid bike. I'd have no problems taking this on some off-road trails and I'm kind of planning on doing that before I sell the bike. I really like this bike. It makes a very good impression to me. I don't know if I'll keep it, <laughs> but it makes a very positive impression. And also the color is pretty cool as well, in my opinion. So really nice bike. The one thing I will say is that it seems to be pretty heavy. It's it's quite a substantial bike. It's all aluminum, um, but it is, it is pretty heavy. Um, but on the positive side, you have rack mounts here at the back as well as at the front. So you can put your full touring racks on there if you want, your fenders all around. Uh, so it is quite a well thought out bike. 
and I really like it. Okay, now let's jump into fixing this bike up, and there's not that much to do because it is in pretty good condition, so it just needs really a tune-up, but the first thing I have to do is fix the flat tire, so I'm going to do that, and then we're going to give this bike a thorough cleaning and then see where we're at. So let's start off with the tire. I need to get the wheel off the bike, obviously. This is quick release all round. I guess that's a slight disappointment, but oh, that just fell out of there. Not really a big deal in the grand scheme of things. Sorry, I think a car is about to drive past, but... I'm already in the process of uh, getting the wheel out. Let's just wait for him to pass, or her. They're not even looking at me. Uh, right, so the wheel, um, yeah, not much to it. I mean, there's no uh, clutch to deal with here or anything. Um, I suspect that there is a puncture here, but let's just try and pump it up, see what happens. All right, let's go ahead and pump this up and see where we're at. There's no air at all in this tire, so I'm, 99% sure there's a puncture, but just in case, uh, let's just try and see if I can get some air into this tire. <laughs> okay, I don't know what just happened there, but um, clearly something is going on. Is there even a tube in here? Uh, I can't really tell. Let's take the tire off and figure out what's going on over here. Well, I'm noticing one thing here, which is very strange. The little retaining ring for the tube is on the inside of the rim. So clearly someone's been in here who didn't really know what they were doing. Also, this tube is not the right tube, I'm sure. This is a road bike tube of some sort. 700 by 18 to 26. And this is a 700 by 38 um, tire. So the tube is wrong. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if uh, I have a spare tube. Yeah, this tube here is just totally wrong. It's, it's clearly a road bike tube. It's very, very thin, very, very light and way too narrow. I don't have the right tube, unfortunately. So I cannibalized the tube from my gravel bike. That bike still has the studded tires on it and they need to come off. As you can see, it's, well, there's still some snow on the ground there, but it's pretty much straight spring. So I think I'm going to change those tires, maybe buy a tube later today and use my old tube for this bike. So let's go ahead and get it installed. Actually, let's check to make sure that there's nothing in this tire that's going to cause uh, another puncture, first of all. OK, I think I figured out what the problem is here. There's actually a pretty substantial cut in the casing of the tire, and it kind of looks like somebody cycled over a blade of some sort. There's a very clean cut here that's about half an inch long, maybe 10 to 15 millimeters. I'm sure that destroyed the old tube. And then I think whoever had this bike before didn't know how to replace the tube properly, gave up and that's why it ended up on Facebook. So I'm gonna try and fix the cut in the tire. I think I could probably get away with just putting the tube back, um, but I had a little look on how to fix a cut in a tire and there's ways of stitching the cuts together but I was reading through some forms and apparently you can also use uh, an inner tube patch just to kind of strengthen that area. So that's what I'm going to try here, kind of a low budget way of doing it. Um, so let's bring in for a close up and try and fix this cut. Okay, so here's the cut in the tire. And as you can see, it's a fairly substantial cut, but it's also a fairly clean cut. And I'm going to try and just patch that with a normal inner tube patch kit. So I've already sanded the area lightly, and even though I just sanded it very lightly, you can see that I've really worn away through this rubber and come up with, um, come up to where these fibers are. So I'm not sure how well the patch will adhere, but let's try and patch it anyway. And I'm going to try and patch it like this so that the cut is held in a neutral position. So I'm going to go ahead now and get some of this vulcanizing compound onto the cut. I need to open up the little container here. And I'm just going to spread a thin layer of that uh, all around where the cut is. Whoa. Just check that for size. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, let's just spread that around a little bit with the back of the tube. That's better. Yeah, I like that a lot more. 
Okay, that seems pretty even. And now I'm just gonna wait for five minutes for that compound to dry. Okay, it's been about five minutes now, and as you can see, this vulcanizing compound is now completely dry. And now let's attempt to put a patch on. I'm not too sure about this, again, because of those threads showing. But all I really need to do is prevent the tube from escaping out through that hole. So I think if there's something in front of the tube, that will be fine. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a patch. I've got a large patch here. I'm going to peel it off of the backing. And uh, see if I can just get it in there in kind of a neutral way. Maybe even, which I know you can't see. Yeah, I think something like that will be fine. So let's hold that on there for a couple minutes. Kind of press that into place. And I think that's job done. Now, what I used to do is peel this plastic off, and then I've since learned that that plastic needs to stay when you patch uh, a tube. So I'm going to leave that plastic in this case as well. That actually seems to have adhered pretty well. And now we can go ahead and put the tire together. Okay, well that seems to have worked surprisingly well, but the only way to really know is to put the tire back together. So let's mount the uh, tire on the rim first, and I will line up the logo with the valve hole. This is a wire bead tire, so it could be kind of a stiff tire to get on, but I actually can probably do that with my hand. Yep, that side's on. The inner tube. Losing the valve hole, there it is. I'm gonna just put the ring on now and just inflate the inner tube very, very slightly just so it kind of keeps its shape when I install it. I don't really wanna get any twists in the inner tube. That's kind of why I like to inflate it a little bit. And then if I need to, I can always let the air out again. And let's see if I can do the tire now without the tire levers. I usually can't, but I can try. I want to kind of do this away from where the patch is because I don't want the... Yeah, there we go. All right, tire's on. Now let's um, try and inflate it and see what happens to the tube as well as the tire. I don't actually know where that hole is from the outside. I think it's on the other side of the valve hole, opposite. Um, but yeah, let's put some air in, see what happens. Well, seems to be holding air so far. It's not completely inflated yet. It's seated on that side, but that side, yeah, it's also seated all around on that side. Let's just pump a little bit more in and then try and see where that hole was. All right, well, that tire still has a little bit of give to it. There's a label here that says 75 to 100 PSI, which is kind of insane. I guess that's the difference between this kind of a bike and something like a gravel bike or mountain bike. Um, but I'm going to wait till I get everything put together before I put any more air into this. I'll just close up the valve hole, uh, lock down that ring a little bit more, obviously put on the little valve cap, and see if I can find where that slash was. I might not be able to, because even earlier I couldn't really see it from the outside. Um, it was kind of on one of the edges of the tread. And no, I'm not seeing it, but the repair seems to have worked. So that's pretty good. I guess the real test is a test of time. Um, but yeah, we've got an inflated bike now. I could go ride that thing, but I think I'm going to now um, wash the bike. And then all that's left to do is adjust the gears and the brakes. And I think we'll be good to go. Maybe put some oil on the chain would be good. Um, so yeah, let's get set up for some bike washing. Okay, it's now time to give this bike a bit of a clean. And if you've watched my channel, you might know that I hate cleaning bikes but it has to be done. It's a really important part of routine bike maintenance. So let's go ahead and do that. But in this case, I will take the wheels off as well as the chain, uh, just so I can be a little bit more thorough. I don't always do this, 
but I think in this case that kind of makes sense. Um, so the front is just a quick release as well, a really, <laughs> a very tight quick release, Jesus. Wow. Kind of an over tightened quick release there. Yeah. I'm also, uh, Jesus. I'm also not used to quick releases. I'm used to through axles these days. Um, but yeah, we'll just put that off to the side. And then I'm gonna take the chain off. This chain does have a quick link, which is really nice. So I can just use my quick link pliers to, uh, yep, take it off right there. Now there is debate about how reusable these quick links are but I'm not too worried about it. I reuse them uh, fairly often. There we go. And I'm just gonna drop this into a bucket full of degreaser with a little bit of water, and then I'll swirl that around, and that's how I clean the chain if I take it off of the bike. And now I'm just gonna spray the bike down with a bit of water. This is not a how-to because I don't like doing this and I'm not very good at it, but what I do is I just spray the bike down with a bit of water and then I get a bucket full of just water with dish detergent. And the key is to get some brushes. This is a soft mechanics brush. That's really good for getting the major surfaces. And then some sort of a medium-sized brush like this is really good for places like here behind the fork, underneath the um, seat stays, places like that. I've also got a small stiff brush, which I like using for the chain rings. A toothbrush works just as well. And then I've got some degreaser, which I'll use on the derailleur. I'll use it on the chain ring and I'll use it on the cassette as well. I'll do the wheel separately. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and I won't show all this, but let's go ahead and start cleaning uh, the bike. So you wanna use a really soft spray, something like a rain shower. You can also just use a regular bike bottle and just kind of um, squirt some water onto the bike, but I'll just go ahead and just kind of, you know, just get the whole bike wet and then we'll get our soap out. And I'm just gonna start hosing, not hosing, just gonna start washing the bike a little bit using the brush. Now, are any of these components sensitive to um, the soap? In my opinion, you don't really need to worry about that too much. I'd say just wash the bike. Don't be crazy rough with it. The main thing is don't spray water too hard at the bike, but you can kind of go over everything with a mild soap, a dish detergent, a bike soap, something like that. And as long as you spray the water off afterwards and don't leave soap on there, you'll be totally fine. And then again, a brush like this is much better for getting into some of these nooks and crannies. With the wheels in there, you'll have more of those. But even with the wheels out, there will be some nooks and crannies that you can't really get with the big brush. And what I kind of do is I'll just go over the major parts of the bike first. Uh, then I'll spray it all off. I'll take some degreaser, go over the chain ring and just the areas around the derailleur spray that off again and then just wash the bike again because you'll spray that, you'll get that degreaser kind of everywhere. Right, well that's kind of the main parts of the bike done and now I'm gonna get the hose and just spray it off before the soap dries onto there because it's nice and sunny today. So I wanna get that soap off. Uh, and you just wanna spray till the water runs clean, but you wanna be gentle and not spray at any bearings too much, anything like that. But you do wanna get the entire bike as well. This soap, won't really hurt the bike. Some people say don't use dish detergent, but a lot of people do use it. I use it and I haven't had any problems. Um, and you know, this little bit of water on the bike uh, is much better because you'll have a clean bike than never cleaning your bike and having dirt everywhere. So it is really important to wash your bike occasionally. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get my degreaser and I'm gonna spray a little bit onto the um, chain ring as well as onto the derailleur and then I'm going to brush it again with a brush and then I'm going to change the water and clean the whole bike again and spray it off again. This is where the stiff brush comes in because if you have 
any sort of crap on your chain ring, you can really get in there with this and make sure that comes off. And if you really want to clean it well, you can take the chain ring off and then you can get your chain ring perfect. But this bike isn't that dirty, so I don't think, I don't think that's really necessary. So I'm just going to get in here. And you can kind of do that. You can kind of do, you know, more of a brushing sort of a number. It just kind of depends on the situation you're in. Now I've got kind of the same thing going on here with the derailleur. There's some build up around those little jockey wheels. You can get a screwdriver and scrape some of that off. Um, I'm not sure yet if that's necessary here, but I'm gonna just get in there with a stiff brush and try and get as much of that just dried grease and stuff as I can off of the jockey wheels. And in this case, I don't think a screwdriver is strictly necessary because that is coming off of there pretty well. And you can also always hit it again with a degreaser just to help break that down a little bit more. Okay, so that's the bike now, nice and clean. And I've also cleaned the wheels off camera as well as the chain. And now it's time to put everything together. So the first thing I'm gonna do is get a piston press and just press the brake pads apart just so that there is a big gap there for the brake disc. And then once I start using the brakes, that should all reset and fall into place. Okay, there's the front wheel. Again, this is a quick release wheel. So let's see. You know, one thing that is kind of unusual about this is to have a quick release front wheel with a brake disc. Normally you get through axle wheels with brakes just because you get higher torsional forces. Maybe that's one of the reasons why this is such a small brake disc because it is only a 160 millimeter brake disc. But anyway, this should go together pretty easily here. Uh, just not as smoothly as a through axle. There we go. Let's give that a spin. We got rubbing. We have rubbing on the front brake. But I don't think anything's bent, so I can deal with that in a sec. Um, but let's go ahead and get the back wheel on first. All right, same thing here. I'm going to just get the piston press and I'll just press the brake pads apart a little bit. There we go, a nice big gap there. And I'll just kind of check the, the bearings on the back wheel as well. And they're a little bit stiffer than they were on the front, but they're still smooth. So I don't think this needs to be rebuilt either. Let's give the uh, free hub a spin. This is a very quiet free hub but it is engaging, so I think, I think that's fine. If it was slipping a little bit, I'd say that the free hub would need to be flushed out and, and re-greased, but I think this is fine. And, and those bearings are, are smooth, they're just a little bit stiff. Maybe that's also just because this bike really hasn't been used very much. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and install the back wheel and see how much <laughs> I struggle with this, with this point, from this point of view. This is not ideal. It's gonna mess up my whole perspective on... I need to turn the camera around because I can't see what I'm doing. Or at least turn myself around. All right, let's see if I can figure out... What am I doing wrong here? And yeah, that's all sliding into place nicely. And in a sec, I can go back and just double check that, you know, everything is seated right. But yeah, this wheel seems fine. So now let's install the chain. Okay, now this wheel is seated as well. And this brake disc is also rubbing. So I'll center this brake caliper in a sec. But before I do that, and before I put the chain on, there's one more important step here. I need to deinstall the dork disc, this little plastic disc here, which bikes are required to have when you buy them. But that doesn't actually do anything. It just gets old and it'll eventually disintegrate and fall into the cassette and it'd just be a mess. So I'm gonna deinstall that with a pair of side cutters. So I'm just gonna cut through that plastic, not cutting through a spoke. And then I'll just eat my way towards the center. All right, there we go. Uh, now let's go ahead and get the chain installed. All right, this is easy peasy. I'm just gonna shift the derailleur into the highest gear. 
and then I need to make sure that the chain engages the chain ring properly like so round whoops round the cassette without scratching anything I'll come round the smallest cog and then through the derailleur I need to double check which way the chain goes through the derailleur because there's a plate that separates the two sides of the derailleur and sometimes the chain goes on one side sometimes it goes on the other I think it goes on the inside yes it definitely goes on the inside in this case wait <laughs> it would help if I threaded this through the derailleur properly let's see here I still think it goes well I'm threading it all backwards because I'm a bit stressed because I'm I know I'm being filmed here all right let's see it's got to go that way that way right and then not on the outside of that plate on the inside of that plate is that right that is right <laughs> I had it right from the beginning I think And then I just bring the two sides of the derailleur together with the quick link. I do have that tool that helps holding the two sides of the chain together, but um, I just don't want to get it out right now. So I'm just going to get the quick link together. And then pull on the chain. And yep, I could do that without quick link pliers. Let's give this thing a crank and aside from the fact that the brake disc rubs that seems to be working it also freewheels again the lack of a derailleur clutch means that you do get some chain slap here uh, but yeah that's the chain now I need to have a break because I have something I need to do real quick so if there's still light later on I'll come back and we will get the uh, brake disc centered the gears adjusted and hopefully take this thing for a spin all right, guys, it's a couple hours later now, and unfortunately, somebody is using a leaf blower in the background, but the sun is also quickly setting, and I'd like to get this bike done today, so hopefully that leaf blower isn't too distracting. Um, but I was about to go ahead and get the brake caliper centered around the discs, but before I do that, I'm just going to lubricate the bike real quick. So I've got some finish line dry lubricant here, and I'm going to go ahead and use that to lubricate the chain. All right, now I'm going to just use a little bit of this spray grease on the derailleur pivots as well as the jockey wheel bushings. You can use a lot of different lubricants there. You can use uh, chain oil. You can use something like Tri-Flow. You can use a, a silicon spray or a, a Teflon type spray. But I've got this spray grease, so I'm going to use that. In fact, I'm never really sure what you should use. And no one, no one really seems to know. Um, but I'm just going to put a little bit on the derailleur pivots and the derailleur bushings obviously i didn't take this derailleur apart because it wasn't really that dirty so i didn't think it was necessary um, but i do want to just get a little bit of lubricant in there so that's what i'm gonna do now all right and now it's time to center the brake caliper so i'm going to just loosen it very slightly just with a, an allen key it's always a or at least usually a four millimeter allen key that's pretty tight obviously there's no anti-seize on this normally i'd put anti-seize on everything but it's probably overkill and if it was my bike I'd do that but in this case I'm just gonna keep it as it is um, and I'm just gonna very very slightly loosen that caliper just make sure that can move and then we'll just spin the wheel you can hear it rubbing there and that's actually quite a lot better already it does rub a little bit which means that the rotor could be slightly out of true but i'm just gonna step by step start tightening up that caliper and um, then i'll just repeat the process of spinning the wheel applying the brakes sometimes applying the brakes hard can help this is still 
kind of rubbing though. So it's just going to be a little bit of trial and error now just to get that uh, centered on my part. Okay, so it's been about 10 minutes and I've been struggling with this a little bit, but now it is, it is pretty silent and the brake does work, but it does sometimes still rub a little bit. I think that part of the problem might be the fact that since this is a quick release, the whole wheel could be moving around in the dropout a little bit as well. Um, so yeah, see now it's rubbing again, um, even though the mounting bolts are tight. So I think part of it could just be the, the fact that this is a quick release. And again, it is unusual to have a disc brake in a quick release fork because those braking forces will cause that wheel to shift around a little bit. Um, but I think this is, a prob this is probably as good as I'm going to get it. And for the most part, it doesn't rub. So I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing to the back brake. And then let's take a look at the gears. Okay guys, the back brake was a lot easier than the front. It took me about a minute to do the back brake, um, but that's working actually perfectly and that doesn't change at all when I apply the brakes. So I'm pretty happy with how the brakes are set up. Now let's take a look at the gears. And the first thing I want to do is just shift through the gears and see if the indexing is at all close or if I need to change the indexing. So let's just And I hear some noises coming from the cassette, so the indexing is not quite right. So I'm just gonna kind of do this by listening to it. I'm gonna shift through the gears uh, and then play with that um, adjustment barrel a little bit just to get the cable tension set properly. And before I shift into the largest or the smallest gear, I'm also gonna check the limit screw because I really don't want the chain to derail into the spokes. But first, let's just see if I can get the um, derailleur set up properly here. So a downshift, let's see. So it doesn't seem to want to fall out of the gears properly. So I think the chain is, a, the, the cable is a little bit tight, but let's also just try and eyeball that derailleur hanger. That does look pretty good. You can't know for sure without a derailleur alignment gauge, which I do not have and actually I should buy. Um, but I'm just gonna try and loosen the cable a little bit by turning the barrel adjuster, should be clockwise. I think it's already all the way in. Now it shifts through two gears. Yeah, it's skipping gears and stuff like that. So I'm gonna just have to look at this for a second. And if I figure it out, I'll come back and talk to you and then we'll do the limit screws. All right, guys, so I had to come inside just because it's getting dark out there but there is something fishy going on with the shifting on this bike. First of all, I'm finding it uh, hard to impossible to get the um, derailleur indexed properly. And also at a certain point, as you shift through the gears, the derailleur jumps two gears and then it carries on shifting kind of normally after that. So there's at least a couple things I can think of that would cause something like this. Uh, there's actually probably a lot of things that could cause this but the most likely is a bent derailleur hanger. And I had another look and just visually, it does look like the derailleur hanger could be bent. And there are some scratch marks on the outside of the derailleur as well. So the first thing I'm gonna do is buy a derailleur hanger alignment gauge and try and straighten the derailleur hanger and see if that fixes the problems. I should have bought that tool years ago. Um, I've always wanted one and I think this is a good reason to do that. Uh, but there's, I think there's some other things going on here as well. So first of all, the shifter is not shifting through all the gears. It's only shifting through seven of the gears. I think that could be caused by the limit screws not being adjusted properly, but I went back and did adjust the limit screws on camera and it's still doing that. So I think the shifter um, needs to be cleaned. So I'm gonna slacken off the cable tension 
and try cleaning out the shifter and see if that solves that problem. There's a bunch of different poles in there, a little ratchet mechanism. And if that gets gunked up, it might just not be engaging properly. So that's the next thing that could be wrong. The other thing is that I noticed that as the bike is freewheeling, the cassette is slightly wobbling back and forth like this. It's not very much, it's very subtle, but that is a symptom to me, although I'm not 100% sure of a bent axle. And I've seen this a lot on bike with quick releases. In fact, I think there's always gonna be a bit of a wobble on the cassette on a quick release bike. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, I, I don't like quick releases for this reason because the axle is hollow and it's not very strong and it's very common for those to kind of bend a little bit and then your cassette will wobble a little bit. Actually, this could be a free hub, but I think it's a cassette. Um, so I'm also, I decided that I'm gonna take the hub apart and see if I can see what's wrong with that axle. Now, I used to do this all the time, but it's been years again because I like those through axle bikes. So I'm probably gonna sit, sit down off camera and try and figure that out. And that also gives me the chance to grease up those ball bearings, which is, you know, when I said that the bearings seem fine, uh, but a little, bit, a little bit stiff, I think this could benefit from having the bearings re-greased and it should be a uh, loose ball system so I can re-grease those myself. Um, so I'm gonna do that as well. Um, and then I'll see if the axle is bent and then I'll need to buy a new axle. And I'm gonna check the front as well because this seems fine, although the brake is rubbing again, um, but I just wanna be sure. So that's the other thing that could be going on. And just the fact that I couldn't get the gears indexed properly, there's a lot of reasons why that can happen as well. Uh, first of all, it could be that the B screw is misaligned now I did play with that a little bit, but I need to look up exactly um, what the specification is for this derailleur and adjust the B screw. That's the spacing between the top pulley and the cassette. And there's a specification for each derailleur. So I wanted to look that up and make sure that's right. It could also be that the cable is routed into the derailleur incorrectly, but that is not the case here. And it could also be that the chain is the wrong length. That shouldn't be the case here either because I think this is the original chain. And finally, it could be that the derailleur is just not installed properly because there's a little, a little spacer that goes between the derailleur hanger and the B screw. And if that spacer is in the wrong position, that can cause the derailleur to shift wrong as well. So there's a lot that could be going on here and I'm just gonna have to sit down, I think, and think about this and uh, I will give you an update, but I think I'm gonna cut this video into two parts now. I know that's a little bit annoying, but what I'm considering doing is releasing both parts at the same time, just in case someone wants to watch it all, but I don't wanna make an hour long video. I'm trying not to make hour long videos, but this video is probably 30 minutes long already. So that's kind of the plan. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do. And then I've also got those other two bikes to look at, and I'm probably gonna look at the black bike tonight and make a separate video on that. So. Lots going on as usual. I'm gonna work on my release schedule a little bit um, because right now, today is the 4th of March. And right now I have videos scheduled every Monday until I think the middle of May. And every Friday I've got my Fairlight build videos and I think I have three or four more of those scheduled and one more to film, maybe two more to film, which puts me at the middle of April as well. And I think I'm just gonna start releasing videos maybe more frequently, I'm not really sure. Um, and I wanna try and focus on making videos a bit shorter and a bit better, but they always just get out of hand. Uh, so that's kind of the goal and that's what I'm gonna do with this bike. Uh, so I'm not sure how much of that I'll show on camera. I think I am just gonna have to think about this a little bit without honestly the stress of trying to film myself as well. Um, but I will come back to you and give you an update and we'll do a part two and maybe I'll release them at the same time. And then we'll do the other bikes and there's lots of other stuff coming on the channel. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed that video. This was supposed to be an easy bike. I thought I just had to fix a, the tube and then lubricate everything and it'd be done. But of course, there's other stuff going on. Um, so yeah, I will give you an update. Thanks for watching. I hope you uh, enjoyed this so far. Hope we have a great rest of your day. And maybe I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.